All right. Cast your votes on item 9. Pass unanimously. And item 10 is items from council. Ed, you want to get us started? I do. Should we talk about the joint resolution first? I'm just asking for that to be stricken and I, yeah, I be considered it, in two weeks. It, it has been stricken already, okay. Okay. so it is it's currently struck. I want to just, just comment about uh, much has been made of the discord over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I don't want to get into the minutia, but just try and, and stick to the, to the bigger picture. Uh, I would ask for the public to give us some time to, to work through um, uh, boundaries. I, I, I would not be concerned uh, with the discord. I think uh, health debate is healthy. I don't, I don't think that discord uh, necessarily uh, means that we're automatically going to degenerate into the kind of uh, discord scene in Tulsa. Uh, I think unanimity and the lack of debate is, is almost more dysfunctional than that scene in Tulsa. Um, we should maximize debate, and that requires transparency for all of us to know exactly what the issues are and, and how to, what we're debating. I think that there, there is change occurring. And, and I think that's that's reason for some of the turbulence. And if I can just talk about that for a second, and I know it's esoteric, but uh, Steve Lackmeyer is not just a journalist, he's also a, a historian. And he and others have presented the argument that through Oklahoma City politics history, there, if there's a pendulum that swings back and forth between the private sector having a lot of control and the public. And that at those times that the pendulum swings too far and the private sector has too much control that inevitably you have a backlash and you have uh, turbulence. I think we're in those times currently. I think that backlash is underway. I think a lot of pundits, Bill Bleakley of the Gazette, the, uh, the Oklahoman, would miss the point of the Tea Party and, and others entering the election cycle. Uh, they talked about their social agenda and their ultra conservative, but they, and that they were reactionary, but they didn't talk about what they gave no press to what they were espousing, that being that there's a risk that the pendulum has swung too far and that uh, we're moving from a representative democracy to more of a plutocracy, where a small number of very powerful people are having uh, undue influence on matters. Uh, then we had an election which, which greatly compounded that as an individual or a small number of people used unprecedented means and amounts of money to try and influence who the four of the eight people that were on the council. Uh, and I, I think that, that those wounds are still festering. And I think that needs to be vetted uh, for us to have healing and for the discord, the level of discord to, to decrease, and for us to be able to make decisions. And it wasn't just the private sector. The firefighters union also uh, spent some, a good amount of money on the elections, and now we're, we're considering uh, issues such as emergency medical transport and who should, should uh, take that on. It, it's, it's introducing bias. Uh, if you have this backlash, I think you've got to have checks and balances, and I think that's what's missing from the system right now. That will give us a more orderly transition. If you don't, if you continue the current system, I think that you'll have more reactionary uh, measures in the future. I think the most obvious examples deal with the studies that we are buying from these uh, consultants. Uh, these studies are not using basic scientific principles, and specifically I'm talking about the Convention Sports and Leisure study commissioned by the Chamber in March of 2009, in which we're basing so much of our economic development argument, and we're risking so much uh, based on that one study. These studies are not using basic scientific principles. They're highly subjective. They're rarely subject to examination and review. They tend to reflect the opinion of those who hired them, and they potentially benefit the, the, the consultants themselves who are in the business on which they're opining. The city never did a study on convention center economics and the need for a convention center. Uh, they commissioned, they, they relegated that to the chamber, and the chamber has repeatedly refused to release that study to the public, despite the fact that many, many other cities' convention center studies done by convention sports and leisure have been released to the public. As I mentioned, Pete White and I went to the chamber last week. We read the study. There's nothing in there that's proprietary. There's nothing in there that, that would damage the city, in my opinion, and that it shouldn't be released to the public. 
Instead, what you see is the absolute lack of scientific method. It goes through uh, surveys of those who do national conventions, and all of the economic development hinges on us tripling our non-local, out-of-state convention business. Uh, that somehow we're going to generate 15 national and regional conventions, 15 state conventions, seven public consumer shows, 20 exhibit events, and 12 other conventions. But the body of the text, when interviewing those who do national conventions, asks the question, assuming that the convention center is adequate, assuming that the exhibit halls are adequate, so you're eliminating that whole argument that our convention center is inadequate, would you come here? 96% are saying no, we would not. We definitely would not, or we probably would not. For things that are structural, the weather, the things that Roy Williams pointed out this morning, the weather, the fact that there's not enough direct flights to Will Rogers Airport, uh, these are things that are not going to change no matter what type of convention center you build. And if that, if that was available to the public, we could have been vetting that. The, the study also says the Conventions uh, and Visitors Bureau is underfunded. The public would have to come up with another three to four million dollars a year to handle these kind of events. It, as I alluded to earlier, uh, it would have been nice to know during the timeline debate that the study, that these surveyed indicated that the lack of public transit to and from the Convention Center is a detriment. The lack of sidewalks and trails are mentioned by name. Uh, and, and that wasn't available in our deliberation uh, on the timeline. Populous did a study on site selection. Uh, and unlike previous studies, which it exclude them from later bidding on uh, the project, uh, recommended a, a project that potentially would be built subgrade, where the exhibit halls would be built 45 feet underground. Populous just finished a similar project in Phoenix. Is that a conflict of interest? Are we allowing the private sector to influence our studies? I'm not, I'm not saying they are. I'm just asking the question. And would you eliminate that conflict of interest by just saying, we need a study, but you're not going to, be, you're not going to bid on this? Or you've won the bid, now give us a study. I, I think a major improvement, I learned from Jim Couch last week, that the city will do a study on whether or not the feasibility of a convention center hotel. Because so much hinges on increased business. The, our existing hotel stock downtown hinges. Uh, I'm interested in the Scrivens study, where, where they uh, wanted to become the convention center hotel and opined as to what a 650 room publicly subsidized hotel would do to our existing downtown hotel stock. Uh, and I think that this study, if it's run by the city, can be subject to the highest scientific standards. Uh, I think we should uh, consult. I spoke with Haywood Sanders about 10 days ago. He's probably the nation's leading authority on convention center economics. He's testified in front of Congress. He's written the Brookings Institute study. He's willing to come here and meet with council, meet with the public, and meet with whoever does this convention center hotel. His opinion is that Oklahoma City is, uh, he follows us very, very closely. He follows city council uh, very, very closely. He thinks that we're, we are, getting ready to make very expensive mistakes. And that we would be very, very lucky if the only subsidy that the taxpayer has to come up with is $50 million. Um, so get, reining these studies in, I think, is a way of uh, increasing transparency and decreasing conflict. Again, I think the election has to be vetted. We have to under, understand, we, I, I don't think we can operate uh, under the threat uh, or reward of potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent on the next city council elections if we do or do not uh, fall into favor with, with a certain individual or a small group of individuals. Um, there was not a, a consistent political ideology. That, that campaign was very cynical. It, it rewarded one candidate for being liberal and progressive and then chastised another for being liberal and progressive. So it wasn't that somebody was spending all that money because they believed in that particular political ideology. Something else was at play. I don't think it's, it's, the, it's it, the identity of this individual is now spreading. It's going to come out, and I don't think it can be stopped. And so I would now vet that uh, very, uh, uh, a very prominent individual has, has explained to me how that, that process worked. Uh, other people have said the same name. 
uh, and uh, I, I uh, presented to John Williams two months ago that many people who are in a position to know are indicating that the, the primary ideological and financial force behind this election campaign was Larry Nichols. I asked John Williams, that people are saying this, you need to get, take a message to him that if this is not true, you need to give him a chance to defend himself, uh, and uh, I haven't heard back. Everyone uh, indicates that Larry Nichols is a very good man, that deeply loves Oklahoma City, uh, that he, for me personally, would be a tremendous ally on building density and walkability in a, a healthy city. But he and the, and the people around him are engaging in policy making similar to uh, the way a surgeon does surgery. They are telling everyone what to do and then executing. And it's not particularly democratic. You can have a benevolent plutocracy. You could agree that what, what he's doing is best for the city but it's still a plutocracy and not a representative democracy. Um, there is no evidence that he or anyone else in the Convention Center subcommittee has altered the decision making for their own personal gain or the gain of their companies. There's absolutely no evidence of that, and I want to make that clear. Um, but we've made, placed a tremendous amount of decision making authority and, policy and influence in one person's hands. And, and I think it's legitimate to ask the question, could any human being uh, objectively make decisions for the, for the betterment of, of all the people when so much, uh, the, the Devon company is the ex-CEO of Devon, he's the chairman of the Urban Renewal Authority, we've made him uh, the chairman of the Alliance for Economic Development and just provided them that nonprofit with $700,000. He's on the board of the Mary Gardens Foundation. The Industrial and Cultural Activity Board, and until 2008, the Redevelopment Authority. Um, I, uh, I want to move past this, but I think that for there to be healing and for us to, uh, I, I think this, you know, I, I don't believe in just, in just holding resentments and not publicly voting them. I think the healthiest thing to do is put it out there instead of, 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 of festering. Let us vet it. Let some healing occur. Uh, let us figure out a way that the private sector and the firefighters cannot uh, mingle to that degree in our elections, uh, and then let's move forward. Thank you.